morning. Okay, uh, so uh, this is my probably my first session in Korea, and I'm really excited. Uh, I'll try to use a, a Korean way of saying "anangaseo." <laughs> I hope I got this right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so well, um, so this is going to be uh, a pretty uh, talkative session, I should say, because I plan for doing a demo, uh, but unfortunately, I heard that. Uh, I need a strong internet for that uh, to get my demos working. So I have to change my plan to do a lot of talking. So you have to bear with me for the next half an hour on whatever I say, right? Uh, so what I do, uh, I work for this uh, thing in Red Hat. We call them as developers.redhat.com. So this is open for everyone. So you can go register yourself there. I get a lot of good content and we have fortnightly webinars around the latest tech, including Kubernetes, OpenShift is being our prime technology that we're dealing with. So you can know a lot of good content from our engineers talking about new things that we are coming up and how do you do all these stuff, right? Um, so on this session, so it's just going to be, I'm just going to flip back to my title slide uh, and say that um, it's effective DevOps is going to be pipeline, service mesh, and Kubernetes. I made a lot of confusion here, right? So people, when they read this, um, they might know, like, what does it mean, right? So that's exactly the same state where we are in today. So if you are a DevOps company, you're adopting for DevOps, so it's the same sort of confusion that you get because you don't know what you're doing, right? So we don't know what's my, my role, what is a developer's role, what's an operator's role, how, how does this DevOps work, right? We literally live in this sort of confusion. And what I'm trying to do today is in my talk is that how do we actually break this wall, right? So break this wall and make DevOps work together in tandem, right? To make DevOps more effective. And to be more effective, what all things we need today to make things effective. That's what is going to be my total session today. So with that, so uh, I might be talking on these three uh, little things around the session. I just thought I could give you a quick intro about what these three things are, that three different types of architectural styles that we speak today. So these are the primary ones. Any application development we do, either we do with services, uh, that's a microservices one, and then we just do it with services, a typical monolithic one, or functions or serverless, which we talk today. So that's something I also we do uh, today, right? We need to choose which one we want. And I'm gonna talk about the two styles. Already we have been doing monoliths and services, so I'm just going, my, my talk today is gonna talk only on microservices and functions, how they are going to do, help you in doing your effective DevOps as well, all right? So uh, those three bullets down each of them shows you like what exactly they mean, right? For example, uh, if you take uh, services, they're completely autonomous and loosely coupled, so which means that we typically do our client server model, which I've been doing so far. And then if it's going to be microservices, then it's going to be a single purpose, stateless, independently scalable, and automated. So, We'll see about that, what exactly I mean by that. And then if it's going to be functions, are they going to be ephemeral and just single action? So in a short way, uh, I can call microservices to be single responsibility pattern, and your functions is going to be single behavior pattern or single action pattern, right? That's how I, I want to put that as well. So uh, with that, what we'll do is like, we'll just see uh, our first thing. So this is around service mesh. So why we need service mesh and not all things we need to do it. So before that, so as I said earlier, so a microservice is going to be single purpose, it's going to be stateless, scalable, and then automated. So this is something, your first step towards your effective DevOps is in my, in my perception is that you have to start to make your applications go microservices way. In that way, what I can do is like, I can do single purpose, make it stateless, scale independently out of the other application, there's no tight coupling, and then I can make it automated as well. So we'll see what, how to do automated as well. But the thing is that when people start to go uh, this way, uh, what happens is that they tend to face few challenges, right? So whenever we do something new, especially with microservices, so we try to face few challenges. Let's see what all they. So the first one is, how do I scale my application? So that's going to be my first and foremost challenge that I'm going to. So what I'm calling scaling here is that scaling of my application it's not scaling of my infrastructure. So you know how to do your scaling of infrastructure. You have a lot of technical cloud providers who gives you the techniques to kind of, kind of scale your application or infrastructure underneath it. But that's not something which I want. I want to scale my application. So that's the first and foremost thing which we have with DevOps challenges, right? The second one, how do I avoid port conflicts? So this is a very simple thing, right? You can have any application deployed as a microservice, 
multiple distributed applications. But the real problem, what happens is that, let's say I deploy hundreds of microservices. The first one, let's say it runs on a port, let's say 8080. Once it runs on a port 8080, I'm going to deploy one more service, which is going to run on port 8080 again. So I'm not going to change anything right now. But the problem, what happens is that when I deploy it on my machine, or a VM, or a node, what I call, I have a problem that these two cannot run in tandem, because there's a port clash. So what do you do? I go to my ops guys, or security ops guys, and then say to them, okay, change the port from 8080 to 9090, right? So the first step for them to do is change to 9090, then go back to your security system, change your ADAP rules, add new firewall rules, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to multiply, right? When I do microservices, that's going to keep multiplying because every new service I'm going to put, I'm going to add a new port, which is running on the same machine, and then I'm going to have a conflict again. Let's see how do I avoid this. I need to avoid port conflicts. I still want to run 8080, any given application. I just run, want to run it 8080, no other port changes, right? All right. The third one is like, how do I manage them on multiple hosts? Uh, this is a super critical thing when you are doing microservices or Kubernetes-based deployments or any kind of deployment that you do today. How do I control them? For example, I could be having a service which, could, which needs to access a database which resides on the local host. I don't want it to go over the network for some reasons, right? For, for some constraints I might having. I don't want them to go over the network. So I, what I want to do is like, I want them to be accessed from within local host. Then what happens is that whenever I deploy my application, so I should have a way by which I can go and say, go and sit in the same node where this database exists. So that is something which I want to do automatically. Still we do today, so, but the problem is like we have to rely on a lot of scripts and somebody, a dedicated op operator's guy has to be sitting there working on the scripts, running the scripts every time I deploy my application. So I don't want to do that. That's not the way we do DevOps. So I want to do a little bit different way. The next one is like, what happens if the host is in trouble? This is again an everyday problem if you're doing a heavyweight application. So what happens is the application might eat a lot of CPU or eat a lot of memory or eat a lot of disk. So you might be running out of disk. What happens is that when you are going through your DevOps cycle of CI, CD, the problem, what happens is that it's going to go and keep deploying on the same node, right? It's going to increase the keep deploying and keep failing on the same node. So I want to avoid that as well. So how do I know? If a host is less than CPU, is having disk pressure or a memory pressure, or it's going to have your, let's say, your CPU pressure, then I need to find a way by which I go and deploy it in a different node where I have all these things available for me. That is something I have to do, again, automatically. So everything here, what I'm talking is DevOps, which means that I have to do continuous integration, continuous delivery, which means that everything is automated. So nobody's going to sit in between that. All right? How do I keep them running? So uh, this, again, Another important thing, so if, you are have, if you're doing a production clusters anywhere, you might be having applications uh, which will always be running. If people have known about Zookeeper, uh, it's one of the application examples I could take. So what happens is Zookeeper always tells you that in a production quorum, I need to have five servers always running for this complete leader election to happen and then to work in tandem. Here what happens is that when one of the nodes goes down, then your Zookeeper is not going to work until you get one more node up and form the five node quorum. So in this case, what usually we do, so we make the, the one of the operators guy comes down, see what's failed, and then he starts one more node. So I, won't, I need to have a way by which I need, to, I need to start running them automatically. Let's say if one goes, goes down, I need to have a way by which automatically start a new node. So which, is, which I usually call as desired state in the current state. Right? The desired state and the current state should always be same automatically. Somebody should take care of some robotic mechanism should take care of doing this. So that's what I see them, how to keep them running. And last but not the least, how do I update them? What I mean by update here is that updating them, doing a rolling update, right? So something like, like what I always have a version one running, and then I'm going to do a deployment of version two. That's a typical microservices way. So when I do it on deployment two, V2, then what happens, I still want to have V1 request served until V2 is 100% up. Right? I should have some mechanism by which I can control all these things. So these are all, of, I, could, I could probably put them as one of my top DevOps challenges when you go to microservices, right? So any DevOps guys, when he goes to microservices, when he adopts microservices style of development, then he's going to face all these constraints or problems, what I call as. So how do I resolve this? There's one little solution to this. So I want to go Kubernetes way. So I say, okay, I deploy Kubernetes. Because with Kubernetes, if you go back to my slide one, I can know how to scale that, 
right? I have a way by which Kubernetes automatically scales. You'll also see auto scaling as well. And I know how to scale. With Kubernetes, I can avoid port conflicts. I don't need to worry about what to do with this. And the thing with Kubernetes, I can also do is like manage hosts on multiple hosts because they were using labels in Kubernetes. I can go make things deploy automatically on each of these nodes. Whenever the host is in trouble, Kubernetes will not deploy. If you are known to Kubernetes world, you'll be seeing when there is a disk pressure or a CPU pressure or anything, you'll be seeing Kubernetes saying, I cannot deploy this thing, right? Which means that it saves your resources from failing further. And the third one is like, I also, Kubernetes also knows how to keep my replicas count always up, right? If I say replicas count two, at any given point of time, Kubernetes knows that how do I keep my replica counts up and running, all right? At last, Kubernetes has a way of doing a rolling update, so which also helps you to do the rolling update as well. So if you see this, the first hurdle for any DevOps engineer or DevOps adoption culture guy organization, they are able to go along with these constraints with just one single pro thing, platform called as Kubernetes. With Kubernetes, I'll be able to do all these things much easily, which is my first confident step going towards DevOps, effective DevOps and microservices. So what is OpenShift? OpenShift is again an enterprise Kubernetes platform from Red Hat. So we give, we took, we are one of the top committers for Kubernetes. And what we did is like we take all those enterprise experiences from what we had and then made these applications run, the same Kubernetes run in an enterprise way, giving effect all the enterprise features that is required. You'll see that in a second, what all those things are. And also like we make sure that all these images are based on RHEL, right, at Enterprise Linux, so that like all the Linux containers are quality tested before it's used in the enterprise. Right, so this is much different, but effectively I could say whatever works on Kubernetes is going to work on OpenShift because end of the day, underlying platform is same, right? But I'm a greedy DevOps engineer, right? So I don't want, I don't want something to stop with just whatever I said, right? So I want to do distributed tracing. I, since I'm going to deploy microservices, it's going to deploy across the geographies. It's going to be hundreds of services. I need to find a way if something goes wrong to trace where it has failed. That is something which I want to do. Also, even if it's failing, how do I fall back? What should be my circuit breaker pattern, which is very common pattern with some microservices. I need to know how do I break these things as well, right? How do I fall back and go on? All right, so I have done these two things. I also need to do how do I do metrics and monitoring. So with metrics and monitoring, I need to find out like what, what's a node capacity right now, whether I need to add a new node or something like that. So I need to understand those things also about my application metrics to get how my application is performing, all right? I done all these things, and the last but not the least, I also want to do one more stuff, um, which is operational requirements. So these have become very common nowadays, so I want to do A-B testing, and then I want to know can releases, rate limiting, and access policies, right? If you are a financial organization, then what I'll also be doing is that when I'm doing deploying my microservices or Kubernetes Linux containers inside, I also want to make sure that the intra-container intra uh, communication is secured, right? Because for some security reasons or, or the policies or the constraints that we might have, I want to do all these things as well, which more becomes operational requirements. But the problem what we have been doing today, right? I said the first, the, the confusion wall which I showed you, one of the confusion is that both devs and ops has right now is that where should this logic be there? Whether this logic should be there in application or whether this logic should be there in my infrastructure. So that's the first and foremost confusion when everybody starts out of DevOps is like, where do I have this? So by default, what you have been doing all these days is that we have been trying to add all this infrastructure logic into your application, which means that my application is becomes bulkier, heavier, and maintenance intensive because every time the underlying library about circuit breaker changes, I have to change my application code. When I have something related to distributed tracing changes, I have to change my application. So this has becoming an overhead and a headache for any DevOps guy because this is going to be a problem for application because these are not application requirements. These are more infrastructure requirements which has to be pushed into the infrastructure layer. But again, in a DevOps way, I have to do it automatically. So how do I do this? To do this, uh, I adopt a principle called a service mesh. So this again, this, this was, I was leading the story to service mesh. What typically service mesh is responsible for reliable delivery of requests through complex topology of services, comprised of modern cloud native application. So which means that everything, whatever I've been talking to you in the previous slide, whichever I want to do more, I take them out of my application and then I put it into my 
proxy, right? That's what I said that there is going to be a network proxy which is going to be running there, so which is going to take care of all this heavy load. Then what happens is that effectively your application becomes slimmer and you concentrate only on your business logic. You don't need, you don't, you'll not worry about how do I do distributed tracing, how do I do metrics and monitoring, how do I take metrics and monitoring out. I don't need to rely on any one single uh, programming language. It could be polyglot because everything is taken care of by tracing. All right. So, but here we go to another one which is done. This, this is within Kubernetes. We do with Istio. So, Istio helps you to adopt a service mesh way within Kubernetes platform. So, this is one of I would probably call as one of the de facto service mesh platforms on Kubernetes. We have other ones as well, but I would say Istio is one of the best right now in the market. And also it's part of CNCF, so probably like we get a lot of support from the community as well. So what effectively Istio does to us, right? So this is what I call as microservice bubbles. So what I mean that whenever you develop a microservice, so you need to have all these things in place, right? For example, I need to have a service because it's a microservice, it's going to be distributed. I need to find a way how I can go and pull this out, which is obviously your discovery. And how do I invoke this is again an invocation, right? So we need to have all these three things in place that's effectively done by Kubernetes because the moment I deploy a container, Linux container on Kubernetes, it has a service and then service has a name by which I can discover the service and can call the service as well, right? Which is using invocation. The second one is that I have the infrastructure thing. For example, I have elasticity and resilience given out of the box by Kubernetes. And Istio adds on top of that. It gives you an extra piece of resilience on top of Kubernetes. And again, as I told you earlier, so OpenShift fits here. If you see the observability part of it, Istio gives me monitoring out of the box using Grafana dashboards and data taken out of Prometheus. But what happens is that I need few more things like your logging and tracing, so which is also given by OpenShift, which is again an enterprise features. Right? And then if you go out to the other side of this, you have the other typical enterprise stuff, for example, authentication and pipelines, so which are out of the box given by authentication, also given by Istio, plus OpenShift adds an extra layer of pipelines also to this. We'll see about what pipelines we are there. Right? And you can develop it applications in all these things which I put in middle. I'm a Java developer, so you'll see a lot of Java frameworks there, but you could, you could use any kind of environment here. Right? So this is something where I say that the first kind of DevOps journey, right, we start with underlying the right platform, right? Which is in our case, it's going to be Kubernetes or OpenShift, right? That's going to be a platform where we put our stuff on and we are bang on to ready to do all the nice microservices things which you want to do, all right? All right, so I've been doing microservices, I've been doing all these things, but right now the problem what I might be having is that I'm eating a lot of resources, right? So I'm going to have distributed application. The application is going to run across the cloud. It's going to run 24 cross 7, and then it's going to eat a lot of your CPU resources, cloud resources, et cetera, even if it's not used, all right? For example, like I could have a cron job, uh, which could, I could have deployed as a microservice as well, and it could be running on a server, which will be running 24 cross 7, and then, it's, for example, it needs to run only from night 12 to 12 10. But what I'll be doing is I'll be running it all the time which means that it's eating my resources because it just need to run for 10 minutes. So how good it will be just when I want to use it on demand, right? That's what something which you're going to see right now. That's our next architectural style, which is serverless. So um, in serverless, as I told earlier, so it's going to be ephemeral and single action, all right? But what happens is that when I talk about serverless, people think this is serverless. Do you agree? <laughs> so that's what something which, which even I had the problem when I was first time attending a, my very first serverless conference. So what happened is like people, when I say serverless, they gave me a little uh, sticker to stick on my laptop which says that somebody was kicking a CPU box out, saying that there is no servers. I was surprised, like, is that the case? No. Servers are still there. You're going to have servers, but the servers are going to run on demand. So that's what we're going to talk about, right? It says that, I do not do need to do required server management. So this is something from the official CNCF blog. And then it has a frying grain deployment model. We'll come back to that in this second. And the very important stuff which we were talking earlier is that executed, scale, and build to exact demand. I say I call this on-demand serving, right? That's what I call them as in my words. So this is saying in this case, what happens is that I'm going to get an effective use of my resources. All right. So how do I do this and what do I gain? 
So again, agility in any cloud environment, that's the first thing why I need to use serverless, because I can plug in and plug out, move across, do anything, and then any cloud environment, if I'm going to have a common platform, then it's going to help me in getting the agility faster to the market. And event-driven cloud-native applications, that is something which is gaining popularity of late. So I want to do event-driven across my cloud-native applications, which means that, for example, I might be running one on hybrid cloud, one in uh, Azure, another one in AWS, and I want these two things to communicate with each other. How do I do this? Right? Nowadays, we don't have any other way to do this. What we have been doing it's with CNCF, they have been developing something called as cloud events, which is a standard across how do we exchange data between cloud. So whenever it happens, what happens, like an exchange of data from AWS to Azure over events, and this data could be in cloud event specification format so that my receiving application can understand and do whatever it's needed. Right? That is something which you can also do. And then it's also, again, on serverless way. And focus on business differentiation. What I mean here is that most of the time, if, for example, let's do, we are going to do a POC. I'm just taking an example of doing a proof of concept or proof of technology. What basically I do is, like, I spend up time. Let's say I have one week time to do this. I spend up almost six days just to set up my environment. All right? If you imagine, like, this will be your experience as well, because I'll be spending 80% of my time doing my environment setup, and then I'll be doing only 10% of the time doing the actual POC. So this has been a case so far, and we have been using a lot of resources, including the very valuable human resources like the developers we are. We will be using all these things right here, but the problem is that we are not effectively doing this. My business differentiation is that if I, my proof of concept works, then that's going to be my next business feature which I'm going to launch. Right. So how do I do this? Instead of spending you spending the time right there, use serverless technologies where I can do is like I don't, I don't need to worry about how do I build my platform, how my applications work, how do I do? I just develop my application and then deploy it as a serverless application. That's it. So my underlying platform knows how to start up my server, run the application, and show it to the world like what you need to do. All right? And last but not the least, consistent and scalable operations. What I mean by this with the serverless thing, I can have a consistent scaling across. For example, if I use a platform like Knative, so which is my serverless uh, platform for doing serverless workloads on Kubernetes. So when you do with Knative, what happens is it does not, irrespective of whether you're running it on Azure or Amazon or Google or Alibaba or any kind of a cloud, I don't need to worry how it actually scales because it's going to be consistent. Right? Because it's going to use the technologies as on top of Knative, Kubernetes Knative, and then how it's going to do these things out there, right? So it's going to be a native way of doing things on serverless workloads rather than the underlying platform, which also gives you that you're not locked in to any one given specific cloud provider who gives you the serverless service, right? Right today, we have the problem there because if you're taking Azure Lambda, if you're talking, uh, I mean, if you're taking Azure Functions, Lambda, or anything, right? We have to be there in their cloud to do this work, right? But with Knative and OpenShift and Kubernetes, you don't literally need to be there that way. All right? So what effectively means is that I'm having a lot of resource and cost optimization, right? which means that I achieve a lot of resources and cost optimization because of this. So we adopted serverless, service mesh, and then we had deployed lots of microservices. But with effective serverless way, what I can also achieve is that I can achieve more cost, resource cost and cost optimization. All right? All right. Uh, what we have next? Sorry. going, I hope. So what are the capabilities you get? As I said earlier, since it's going to be on Kubernetes platform, uh, on Knative, I can go from scale to zero, which means from no pod, no memory. Right? That's effective Knative, right? So I don't, if I'm not running any pod, your cloud provider is not going to cost you any money, right? The second one is that it's op right opposite of scale to zero, which means that I can go from scale from zero based on your traffic spikes. In case if you have more requests coming in, for example, if you're a retailer and it's during Christmas or some, some festival time, then I'm going to have a lot of spikes, people coming hitting your site. At that time, it should automatically scale. That's what I talk about traffic spikes start from end. And then configurations and revisions. Uh, since we are doing cloud native application, we are going to follow 12 factor ways of doing cloud. And out of the box, Knative gives you all these 12 factor ways of doing things. And in cluster image building, you'll see that in a second. Also get the few other things like your traffic splitting and event system as well. Right? All right, so we talked about service mesh. We talked about how do we do serverless, right? But one little piece we are missing 
in a, in a, to be an effective DevOps is that how do I make this automated way? That's one of the super critical thing for DevOps is that I reduce my six months long development, delivery, production life cycle to three weeks or two weeks or whatever we call us in the agile way. So how do I achieve this? So for that, so I introduce you to a new thing called as Tecton. So this is a CI CD based on the CD foundation governed by Country's Delivery Foundation as well. And it's contribution from Google, Red Hat, CloudBees, Pivotal, and everybody's contributing to this project, which means that it gives you an in-cluster image building, right? For example, all these days, Kubernetes has one drawback, I could call, is that I cannot do in-cluster image building, right? I have to rely on any of the container runtime, which is underneath that I have to install the client, and then do all these things from a machine, push it to an external registry, and pull it from an external, external registry, right? So what if we want to do an in-cluster image building? I, let's say I run a, for example, for my development case, I take a Minikube example. I run a Minikube on my machine and I want to do an in-cluster image building using Minikube. Then how do I do that? And that's what Tecton does you. So, but why we Tecton, you'll be asking, there are a lot of CI CD products around the world. So why do I really need to go to Tecton? Uh, the principal reason is that Tecton is cloud native. So which means that it runs on Kubernetes, use containers as their building blocks. So that's a very important thing. Like I use containers always, even if you're running a CI CD, external CI CD tool, if you have to bring it inside Kubernetes, I have to containerize the tool and deploy it. And there are a lot of other things, right? Resource CPU, et cetera, et cetera. So a few things are optimized right out of the box, which means that I am going to use containers as my building blocks. It's totally decoupled. I can have pipeline tasks can be uh, put together. I can have pipelines, tasks, and, and can make them tasks run individually or also as part of pipelines as well. And lastly, it's typed, which means that I'm going to use uh, what I call, I can swap in and swap out images, right? I can use uh, Kaniko to do a build, or I can use a Docker build. I can use Builda to do a build. I can use any other technologies that use to build your Linux container images. So that means that it's typed. You don't need to worry about that as well. So with all these things, what you achieved right now is that I was able to break this up, right? And right now, when you are a dev or you are an ops guy, so you know like, okay, we have the right tools to do the job. I know what to do right now to make the DevOps go a next step in within your organization, right? adopting these kind of styles and techniques that helps you to do much effective DevOps as well, right? With that, like, uh, I will probably end my talk. It's a thank you. And then if you have any questions, you can reach out to my Twitter handle, which is right there, GitHub, and my email, which I shared earlier. The slides has my email as well. You can drop me a note if you have any questions or other stuff. And thank you so much for coming today and for my talk. Thank you.